What is going on everybody? My name is John Solo and this is Fables Explained, the show that somehow ruins and improves childhood simultaneously. We do this by taking your favorite childhood stories, tracing them back to wherever they came from, and breaking down the many evolutions they went through over time. Today's subject of discussion is a highly requested one, the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. It's a fairy tale we were all told at some point, and if you're one of the few who wasn't, you probably saw it referenced by Disney, Looney Tunes, Spyro, Looney Tunes again, Tom and Jerry, Sesame Street, or a billion other places. It doesn't really matter what version you're most familiar with because the same plot elements are present in almost every one. A young lad named Jack trades the family cow for some magic beans. In a fit of rage, his mom throws those beans out the window. They grow into a giant beanstalk. Then Jack climbs the beanstalk and learns there's a man-eating giant living in the clouds. He always steals something of great value from that giant too. A bag of money, a bird that lays golden eggs, a harp that plays itself, and sometimes all three. At the end of the story, when the giant finally catches him in the act, he chases Jack down the beanstalk, but the lad is just a little faster, and when he gets to the bottom, he chops the beanstalk down, causing the giant to fall to his death. Since Jack and his mom are now independently wealthy, they live happily ever after, and that's the end of their adventure. This story fits in Arne Thompson category number 328, The Treasure of the Giant, which should come as no surprise given how the story's events revolve completely around the giant's treasure. The most popular version of this fairy tale, the one that's being referenced in most of the examples from earlier was written by Joseph Jacobs and published in his collection called English Fairy Tales in 1890. However, while his rendition is the one most people know nowadays, it was definitely not the first. If you've seen our show before, you no doubt know that many of the stories we talk about are tales that were shared only orally for hundreds, if not thousands of years before they were written down. As a result, we rarely get to learn who really came up with many of these fables or what their motivations were. This is also the case with Jack and the Beanstalk, where researchers have recently traced it back 5,000 years back to the Bronze Age when it was being told in ancient Indo-European languages that don't even exist anymore. And while the details have no doubt changed over time, the story seems to have always been about a man ascending to a magical land in the sky where both dangers and riches are lying in wait. And now that the hype has been adequately built, it's time for us to jump into it. Make sure to hit that like button to support the channel and keep our family growing strong, and subscribe and ring that bell next to it to be notified notified whenever a new episode of Messed Up Origins is delivered to your sub box. Now our earliest written record of Jack and the Beanstalk was published and sold during Christmas time in London in 1734. Our boy Jack was given a chapter in the second edition of the book Roundabout Our Coal Fire or Christmas Entertainments. It was written by Dick Merriman, which is most likely a pseudonym. It's by no means an exaggeration to say this book is weird as hell and definitely not meant for children. Some of the other sections include a rant about how no one celebrates Christmas like in the good old days, i.e. giving out free food, details about the lifestyles of hot goblins and witches, and instructions about what to do if you find two people in bed together when playing hide and seek. It might sound like a fun, zany book to skim through, but it's objectively not. Between the random subject matter and the clunky writing style, it actually reads like the work of a madman, and for all we know, it is. This holds especially true for its chapter called The Story of Jack Spriggins and the Enchanted Bean, which I forced myself to read so you wouldn't have to. An important heads up before we get started, you're going to want to pay close attention to this one. Not only is it one of the most bizarre stories we've ever covered, it's even less coherent than the most nonsensical parts of Alice in Wonderland. I'm gonna do my best to keep it flowing like a normal story would, but if at any point you find yourself thinking, what is this dude talking about? Just know that I'm thinking the same thing. So our story about Jack Spriggins starts with a weird old man named Gaffer Spriggins doing what most weird old men in these stories tend to do. He breaks the fourth wall and says to the reader, let me tell you a story about the lazy, dirty jagaloo known as Jack Spriggins in the magic castle in the sky. So just imagine the rest of this story being told by an old man rocking on a porch, wearing dirty overalls, and chewing on wheat, or whatever farmers in cartoons are always chewing on. In this version, Jack lives with his enchantress grandma in a crappy little shack, and they have a very weird relationship. The book says that they lay together every night, and at one point she refers to him as a good bedfellow. Yeah, I felt violated just saying that. One night, Jack's old lady, pun intended, tells him that she has a magic bean that will make him richer than an emperor and put the whole world at his command. Naturally, Jack says, well, give me that bean then. 
but she refuses, claiming he'll forget all about her as soon as he gets it. Well, the next morning, that magic bean falls out of her purse, and Jack plants it, not because he wants to be rich and powerful, mind you, but because he's in the mood for bacon and beans. The stalk sprouted immediately after he planted it, and he ran inside to tell his grandma, but she is pissed because that meant that within an hour, she'd transform into a toad. I know Jack might not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but I feel like she could have just told him what would happen to her when he planted it, instead of saying, you'd forget about me, boo-hoo. Sadly, the enchantress didn't think that one through, so when the beanstalk sprouts, she attacks Jack with a broom, so he has to climb it to get away, and within an hour, she turns into a monstrous toad. The beanstalk continues to grow until it's about 40 miles high, and Jack continues to climb it. A detail unique to this version is that the beanstalk had little towns on its leaves so Jack could stop to refresh himself. It's when he stops at a tavern located near the giant in the sky's castle that this story goes completely off the rails. First off, when he gets there, the bartender says, order whatever you want. We have everything in the world, but everything Jack orders, chicken, eggs, beef, mutton, veal, they're fresh out of. So Jack basically gives up and says, just get me some ale and I'll go to bed. Only whatever he ends up drinking is closer to ayahuasca than ale, because after only the first sip, he enters a dreamlike psychedelic state. The roof flies off the bar, the bartender magically turns into a beautiful woman that claims to have once been his grandma's cat, weird, and a dozen attractive young ladies enter on horses. They start referring to Jack as Lord of the Manor and Invincible Champion, the same way that strangers refer to me on a regular basis, and before long, he's surrounded by even more magical characters. And it only gets crazier from here. One of those magical characters gives him an enchanted ring that will grant him several wishes. In the following order, he wishes for food, his fine lady to have some clothes, because apparently she was naked this entire time, good music, and to be in bed with his lady. Each of those wishes are granted, the couple falls asleep, and they both have a dream where some kind of fairy spirit makes them a prince and princess before telling them of a prophecy. According to this prophecy, they must go to the giant's castle where they'll be safe and entertained for three days as long as Jack keeps the stone on his ring and the princess to his north. See, if they're not to his north, then the protection enchantment just won't work. I know, totally obvious in hindsight, right? Oh, and by the way, turning his ring to the south will make the princess transform into a basilisk and kill everything in sight that isn't Prince Jack. Couldn't forget that detail. The next morning, they walk over to the giant's castle and they hear him cry out, Fee, fa, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Whether he be alive or dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Now, even with context, fee, fa, fum is a pretty random phrase to be shouting at the top of your lungs. And this wouldn't be messed up origins if I didn't look into where it came from, so here's what I found. The earliest written variation of this rhyme went fi, fa, and fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. In 1596, the playwright Thomas Nash included it in his written response to English author Gabriel Harvey, who at that point he had been publicly feuding with for years. Nash stated the phrase existed for ages before he ever wrote it down, but I think it's funny our first record of it comes from a feud between writers who were dropping disses on each other and selling those disses to the public in pamphlet form. A variation of the phrase can also be found in Shakespeare's 1605 book, King Lear, where he switched the phrase to fi, fo, and fum, I smell the blood of a British man. As many of you know from when we talked about Hamlet in my Lion King video, William, look how unique I am Shakespeare, liked to take mainstream ideas and change them just a little bit so his version would stand out. That's basically what he did with Hamlet when he adapted the already existing story, Hamlet. As for what the phrase actually means, we know the word fi is used to express outrage, so it's basically just jargon to show that a character is angry. Anyway, Jack and the princess knew they were safe because of the ring's enchantment, so they entered the castle without worry and ended up surprised when the giant, known as Gog Magog, was excited to see them. Probably because Jack had a pretty young thing under his arm and the giant was partial to pretty young things. That night, when the prince and princess were laying in bed, still at the giant's castle by the way, they heard the voices of thousands of virgins crying for help. If for some reason you want to know what that sounds like, just YouTube any Fortnite night esports event. Jack knew that this was the time to use the ring's power to its full potential, so he turned the stone to face south, which transformed the princess into a basilisk, 
and allowed her to kill the giant by turning him to stone. Afterward, Jack twisted his ring to face north again, which allowed him to make even more wishes. With the ring's help, he easily navigated his way to the room where the virgins were being held captive, set them free along with some knights in shining armor, and on a pretty abrupt note, the story ends. What I tell ya, that was a crazy one, right? And not a lesson was learned throughout the whole thing. What may be the craziest part is this was the only Jack and the Beanstalk story published for over 70 years. Either because no one knew how to adapt a story like that, or no one wanted to because it kinda sucked. Either way, in 1807, we saw two new versions get published, each with their own unique, messed up details. First, we'll talk about the children's booklet called The History of Mother Twaddle and the Marvelous Achievements of Her Son Jack. I know achievements is spelled wrong, that wasn't my doing. I'd say take it up with the author, but the only credit they gave themselves was their initials B-A-T. So we don't even know who wrote it, and whoever they are, they're definitely dead now. So this story, which is complete with colored illustrations, starts with a woman finding six pence in her house and sending her son Jack to buy a goose with it. However, instead of buying a goose, Jack buys some colorful beans from a Jewish fella who claims their magic. I don't know why he was Jewish specifically, feels a little anti-Semitic, but let's move on before we get demonetized. That night, Jack plants the beans, and by the next morning, they're already grown into a massive beanstalk that stretches up to the sky. Falad climbs it and discovers it leads directly to a giant's house, and after some convincing, the giant's maid, who was sitting outside when Jack showed up, let him in for some food. It's not long before we hear a variation of the classic rhyme. Fee, fo, fan, I smell the blood of an Englishman. If he be alive or if he be dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. It's important to note here that since the rhyme was included in this version, we know the author was familiar with either the oral version of the story that had been passed on for millennia, or the wackadoo one we just talked about. My guess is the former, but no one knows for sure. Anyway, Jack hides under the bed while the giant is sniffing around, and the quick-thinking maid convinces the monster the smell is coming from his freshly prepared food and to drink a massive jug of wine before sitting down to eat. This gives Jack the opportunity to use his new Sandman perk, so he grabs a knife from a nearby table and cuts off the giant's head. If the grandma's bed fellow thing and the anti-semitic bit didn't get us demonetized yet, that picture probably will. Anyway, since the maid was so kind to Jack in his time of need, and probably a little because Jack just killed the guy who was signing her paychecks, the two agreed to get married and they lived happily ever after. So you may have noticed that that story didn't exactly have a moral either. Jack essentially convinces the giant's maid to let him trespass on his property, then the two get him drunk, cut off his head, move into his house, and take all his treasure. What is she, a Kardashian ancestor? Well unlike our previous tales, this next one, called The History of Jack and the Beanstalk by author Benjamin Tabert, actually shows some character development. Funnily enough, it kind of reminds me of a story we covered a long time ago called Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. That's because in the beginning, the protagonist is a total loser that's nothing but a burden on his widowed mother, but then, thanks to his encounter with the fantastic and otherworldly, he's forced to embrace responsibility. This is also the longest of the Jack and the Beanstalk stories by far, and is what likely served as inspiration for the classic and far more concise version by Joseph Jacobs that we talked about earlier. It was also the first to introduce elements like the family cow, the bird that lays golden eggs, and the enchanted harp, what we've come to think of as staples of the story. And because this one is so similar to the version we've already heard and are familiar with, I'm gonna do my best to keep it concise and try to emphasize only the most important parts. Like the surprisingly detailed backstory Tabbert gave Jack to make him a more empathetic and heroic character. Okay, so you already know the setup. Widowed wife is stuck supporting her good-for-nothing son Jack, who's bled her bank account completely dry. She makes the mistake of trusting that son to sell their only possession worth anything at all, their cow, but he screws it up royally by trading it to a shysty looking butcher for some magic beans. In a fit of anger, his mom throws the beans out the window, another part that first appeared in this version and sent Jack to bed without any dinner. But the next morning, those beans had sprouted into a massive beanstalk that stretched all the way to the sky. As you would expect, Jack's mom begged him not to climb it, but this was his call to adventure. Like in The Hobbit, when the dwarves invite Bilbo to be their thief, or Harry Potter, when he gets his letter from Hogwarts. Homie had to seize this opportunity, and it's a good thing he did, because there was a fairy waiting in the skies above, ready to set him on his destiny. The fairy offered to reveal the truth about his deceased father, 
in exchange for Jack swearing to follow whatever orders she gave him after. And if he backed out at any point, he and his mother would be destroyed. A risky deal to be sure, but it paid off. Jack learned that his father was an extremely wealthy and generous man with love in his heart for all living things, but he was manipulated by a giant who was as evil as he was good. When Jack's father was recommending a book to the giant, it stabbed him in the back and only spared Jack and his mother out of pity, but regretted doing so. In exchange for her life, Jack's mom swore to never tell her son the truth about his father so he'd never be motivated to get revenge. Then, shortly after she left, the giant burnt the house down. The fairy reveals that it was by her design that Jack sold the cow for beans and was motivated to climb the beanstalk. Then, gives him the orders he's been waiting for, he needs to kill the giant and avenge his father's death. Jack wasted no time after receiving his orders and marched right to the giant's house, where his rather large wife was waiting outside. Now at this point, Jack is genuinely hungry because he's gone about a day and a half without any food, so he begs the big woman to let him inside and feed him. It takes some convincing, but she eventually gives in, and on their way to the kitchen, Jack looks around the house and sees all the treasures this giant stole from his father and many other victims. Before he can actually get some food though, the giant shows up and says he smells fresh meat. Curiously, this is the only version I read that doesn't include a variation of fee fi fo fum. Weird. Well, the giant's wife hides Jack in the oven, not the best hiding place I know, while she serves her husband some freshly baked human. The giant then proceeds to eat himself into a food coma and passes out while entertaining himself with a chicken that lays golden eggs. Jack then snuck out of his hiding place, grabbed the magic bird, and hightailed it back to his mother, who was overjoyed to see him. But his adventures with the giant had only just begun. The two lived off the profits from selling their golden eggs for a few months, but Jack was having constant anxiety about the fairy's threats and eventually had to sneak up the beanstalk again without his mom knowing. The following events unfold in a way that's very similar to last time. Jack disguises himself to trick the giant's wife into letting him in again. He hides when the giant gets home, then steals some bags of gold and silver coins when the big man falls asleep. About three years pass before Jack makes another trip up there because he doesn't want to send his mom into a full-blown meltdown, which is what happened last time. But eventually, he has to bite the bullet for their own well-being. He gets another disguise, this one even more tricksy than the last, convinces the big woman to let him in her house against her better judgment, and then he hides in a copper pot while the giant eats dinner and once again passes out, this time while listening to a singing harp. Jack found himself wanting this harp more than any of the other riches he'd taken back, but as soon as he grabbed it, it started screaming and woke the giant up. The boy climbed down the beanstalk as fast as he could, which at this point was pretty fast because he'd done it so many times before, and when he got to the bottom, grabbed hold of a hatchet. Jack swung that baby into the beanstalk I don't know how many times, but he managed to cut it down eventually and send the giant falling to his death. When Jack was sure his troubles were over, he turned to his mother and apologized profusely for all the trouble he'd caused her, and at that moment, the fairy showed up to offer some clarification. She told his mom that Jack's misadventures up the beanstalk were all by her design, and she completely forgave him. Then, the fairy made Jack swear to follow in his father's footsteps and only ever treat others with respect. And then he and his mom lived happily ever after. So that, Solo fam, was the messed up origins of Jack and the beanstalk. What are your thoughts on it? Did you have a favorite out of the few versions we broke down? I personally enjoyed how Tabbert fleshed out the story's universe and added some context to the ridiculous series of events that were about to unfold. I think that Joseph Jacobs' adaptation of it benefits from being more concise, and in my opinion, it flows quite a bit better, but I'm excited to hear what you thought. Make sure to comment your unique perspective down below, and as always, I'll be reading and responding to as many as I can. Now, if you want to do me and your solo bros and sisters a favor, I would greatly appreciate it if you hit that like button. Every single like, comment, and share helps the channel in more ways than you know. Specifically, it helps with the YouTube algorithm and making sure these videos keep showing up in your related feed and your sub box. And speaking of sub box, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already to have new messed up content like this delivered to your homepage on an almost weekly basis. It's basically every week, but I took last week off to visit family during the holidays, so I can't say weekly basis without feeling like a liar. So almost weekly basis is where we're at. And to those who consider yourselves a diehard solo cup, make sure to follow me on social media for regular updates about what I'm doing between videos and what episodes are coming up next. Until we meet again, Solo fam, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.